So, without further ado, I thought we'd begin with prayer. And all the Catholics do things begin with prayers. So, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This prayer is actually the opening prayer for this morning, this morning, today's Mass from the Epistle. So, you may have heard it before you came to Mass today. Let us pray. Enable us, we pray, Almighty God, to proclaim the power of the risen Lord, that we who have received the pledge of his gift may come to possess all he gives when it is fully revealed. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. I thought I should begin with a word about Scripture from Scripture. Another way of saying it is from the Pope, in this case, the first Pope, from St. Peter himself. There are two letters in the New Testament that are ascribed to Peter's will. Uh, several, more notably, from Paul's will, one from James, one from Jude, the letter to the Hebrews, and of course, the book of Revelation. And that's the bulk of the letters in the New Testament which followed after St. Luke's volume two of his gospel, Luke and Acts of the Apostles are by that particular evangelist. So this is from the letter of Peter. He's talking to probably the people either in Antioch or in Rome, his bishop in both places. First in Antioch in Syria, and then he took the boat, ended up going to Rome, became the bishop there, ended up you know, as dying in Rome as the, the first bishop of Rome for the Catholic. So St. Peter reminds us, moreover, we, the apostolic community, Christians, we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this. There is no prophecy no prophecy in scripture that is a matter of one's own interpretation. Rather, no prophecy ever came by human will, but by men and women moved by the Holy Spirit who spoke from God. That's where we get, one of the places we get the idea of the inspiration of scripture. God does not either with the quill and the papyrus and the parchment writing the words itself. He's inspiring men and women to write the words that we call the scripture. So people say, oh, this means this, or that means that. So if you take a line of scripture out of context, you're really causing scripture to be damaged. It has to be taken within the context. The sentence before, the sentence after, the paragraph that's in, the chapter that's in, the book that it's in, rather than, ooh, we pluck out the scripture verse and use it to bang someone in the head with it. Not the best use of scripture. <clears throat> if someone's doing that, they can quote scripture left and right, which is beautiful, it's fine, you memorize it. But if you use it as a proof text to prove your point, you're really damaging the Holy Spirit in a sense. You're misusing the gift of scripture as its fire text. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Sense? Thank you. If you get confused, stop me. I'm talking. Make it less confusing, hopefully. So that was the second letter of St. Peter about inspiration of the scripture. Oh. Yes. Go ahead. Can you tell me what chapter? Uh, chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Thank you. Sure. Now, some of you I've spoken to privately about this. I would recommend a Catholic Bible. This has the one or two that I have in my room. This is the paperback one. I usually don't carry around with a hardback one, so it's too heavy. It's sort of enthroned on my, in my room. Uh, but this is a study Bible. It's pretty hefty. It has notes, footnotes, cross-references, maps, introductions to all the books of the Bible, all the sections of books of the Bible, and a handy reference tool in addition to the actual inspired text of the scripture. So if you don't have a Catholic Bible, I suggest you Pick one up, either Amazon.com or your local uh, gift shop, where you can find uh, a Bible. Um, 
The one I recommend this is called the Nabre, N-A-B-R-E. It's the American Bible Revised Edition. It's the one that you'll proclaim from the pulpit. It's the same translation that's used in, in the lecture. If you come to Mass or watch Mass online, you'll have the readings from the lectionary and it will resemble, I think, be word for word from the New American Bible Revised Edition. Yes, sir. Can you repeat the verse? Sure. The yeah, second letter. Second letter of Peter, verse chapter one. Yes. Verses 19 to 21. Okay. So three verses, 19, 20, and 21. The key is whatever translation you happen to have, it's best to have a Catholic one only because. If we're using the Catholic Bible and if something, if you have a King James Bible, the Protestant Bible would have, have missing books. The Catholic Bible has books that the Protestants kicked out back in the 16th century during the Reformation. So if someone is referring to something in one of those books that they had either left out or put in the back of their Bible, you might get lost as to where it is. So that's why I recommend having uh, a Catholic Bible for Catholic Bible study. It's very helpful, like I said, because it provides footnotes, alternate translations to verses, because not all the verses have been translated in the best way, because the text is sometimes missing from the manuscripts. The Bible is more or less 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years old. If we go back to the Old Testament, the oldest parts of the Old Testament, I think the Song of Moses after they crossed the Red Sea, is the oldest piece of scripture we have. But some passages are fragmentary, and it has this, this, the technical term is ellipsis, to have, and God said, they don't know what he took what he said. So they put God said, dot, 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 and go to the next half of the verse. And have a footnote that says the dot, dot, dot is, the text is corrupted, the text is lost, or whatever the situation might be. So it's good to have a study Bible that can give you that kind of information. It'll tell you what the translation would be, or could be, based on what biblical scholars know about the Hebrew and the Greek of the text. But whatever you choose, whatever translation you choose of the Catholic variety, it is important to be comfortable with that translation, whatever the translation is. If you're not comfortable with it, you're not going to read it on a regular basis. So if you like the NRB or NABRD, the Nabre or the NAB, Great. If you like reading the lectionary, we have the word among us or the manager not, stick with it because you're going to read that translation. If you don't like the translation, you probably will keep it around on the bed stand or the pot or wherever you need your, your uh, church help or aid helps. So it helps to know which Bible you're going to use and keep it with you and be familiar with it and learn to love it and keep opening it every day and as your trusted friend. If not, what can I say? Does that make sense? So. As a kind of a preface, I was thinking we would do tonight not so much resurrection narratives, but to go back a little bit, you can't have a resurrection of anyone, let alone Jesus, without a death and a burial. Before the Passion begins, the actual date that we use is the Monday of Holy Week. There's a very beautiful passage from St. John, chapter 12, where Jesus is in the house of Martha, Mary, and Lazarus of Bethany. Lazarus is newly raised from the dead by Jesus. And they're at dinner in the house. And Martha is serving the dinner. And you can well imagine that's her, that's her thing. Martha is the, the, the restaurateur. Mary, the one who sits at the feet of Jesus, the disciple, she comes in with this very expensive nard, and she anoints Jesus. He welcomes it, he accepts it, he's probably enamored of the treatment that he receives, because he knows what's going on in his own mind. He knows things are coming down the pike that no one else in the room does know. Judas, on the other hand, is thinking all of himself, he chastises Mary for wasting this very expensive perfume. It would have cost a year's worth of wages to buy this perfume oil, which came from the Himalayas with the Silk Road from China and Nepal all the way to 
Palestine. That's why it's expensive. It's not like you get your corner store. It's a very expensive import. So this lavish, extravagant, regal anointing of Jesus, even before the Passion begins, signals that something happens later. So we have Mary of Bethany anointing Jesus, and Jesus chastises Judas instead, says, leave her alone. But at, I think the word in Greek is like, shut your mouth. <laughs> we get sanitized English translations of the Greek and sometimes the Hebrew, where Jesus sounds all meek and mild, he's not being meek and mild all the time. I think in this particular instance, Jesus, leave her alone. I think it's more like, back off, buddy. So he's really ticked at Judas for chastising uh, Mary of Bethany for the anointing he's received from her. Then the key part for us, she, Mary of Bethany, bought it, the expensive ointment to Narda, that she might keep it for the day of my birth. She's anticipating the death and burial of Christ. Maybe not consciously, but she's seen her brother die. She's seen her brother lay in the tomb for four days. And she's seen Jesus raise her brother back to life. So she has some inkling of faith here. Martha's the one who says, through the resurrection and the life, I believe my brother will rise. Mary's a little more subtle about it. She performed the act, but Martha gave him the words. So this preparation for the burial of Jesus before it actually happens is kind of interesting, sort of prophetic in a way. Anyone have any questions, concerns? Moving right along. That was chapter 12 of John's Gospel, verse 7, where Jesus chastises his students for being a village about their own. So, pre-resurrection, laying the groundwork, quite literally. The burial of Jesus as described in the Passion Narratives. It happens in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew and Mark are very, very close. Luke is a little bit different than Matthew and Mark. John is very much different than all three, as you can imagine. Uh, the reason for that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke are both synoptic gospels. Synopsis means they have the same eye. They have more or less the same viewpoint, and they do share texts. So Mark is the first gospel to be written. Matthew used Mark. Luke used Mark. Matthew has special stuff that only Matthew has, and Luke has special stuff that only Luke has. John is on his own. He's up there, writing 55 years after the third poem. So a much different gospel from John than from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So the first one is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verses 42 to 47. I thought I'd read through all four texts, and then go back and sort of pick it apart a little bit. So the Gospel of St. Mark, Chapter 15, verses 42 to 47. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself expecting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered, if he were already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he had learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Moses, saw where the body was laid. The next one is Matthew, chapter 27, verses 57 to 61. 27, verses 57 to 61, Matthew's gospel. Again, the Jews of Mark and Matthew shared the same verse. When it was evening, because 
how they're sharing each other. Or imagine the topping of Mark. There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Chapter 23 of Luke, the burial scene of Luke. Chapter 23, verses 50 to 56. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, through a, though a member of the council, had not agreed to the plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was especially waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a little cloth, and laid it in a rock king tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come with Jesus from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath they rested according to the command. So, there is a synoptic version of the burial entombment of Jesus. And now, the big one, St. John, which we hear about on Good Friday, the last part of the Passion Narrative on Good Friday. Every year, we read John's Passion Narrative. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were read on respective years. This year was Luke, on Palm Sunday. So this is John chapter 19, verses 38 to 42. Listen to the similarities and listen to the differences. <coughs> they're, they're salt, but they're there. After these things, the death of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. That's a lot of stuff. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was a Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. <coughs> Matthew, Mark, <coughs> and John. Let's go back to Mark and see if we can figure out what he's going to do. Okay. They were kind of in a rush to get bodies off the crosses not just Jesus, but the other two criminals killed with him. The other two, if you read the scriptures, remember from the scripture, they had their legs broken so they couldn't heave themselves up on the cross to breathe. So breaking their shin bones hastened their death quite quickly. <coughs> when Jesus was found to be already dead on the cross, the soldier in John's gospel pierces his side, and we had that wonderful scene of the blood and water uh, gushing forth. The reason they want to get these guys dead and all the crosses, they're in Jewish territory. Even though it's run by the Romans, they occupied uh, Palestine, but it's certainly <coughs> they talked in a way between the government of Rome and the Jewish high priesthood who represented the nation. Pilate is allowing them a certain deference. <coughs> Before the Sabbath begins, that Friday night, the bodies must be disposed of. So they have to be taken down from the crosses and buried as quickly as possible. So that's why Joseph and Nicodemus get permission to remove the body of Christ and wrap it up 
stow it away in the tomb and go their way. They have to be sighted before sundown. They have to be back in their houses by sundown Friday. Otherwise, it's a violation of Sabbath. These are still good religious Jews. They haven't become Christians as of yet. There's no resurrection at this point. They're not Christians. They may be disciples of Jesus, but there's no Christianity as of yet that we know it as today. So they're good practicing Jews. They have to get themselves home for the Sabbath start. If they're not home the Sabbath start, they can get in trouble. And that's the last thing they need on this night when they're already emotionally uh, warped. Anybody have any questions? So far so good? So back to Mark, chapter 15, verses 42 to 47. Only a few verses. Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. He does everything very quickly, very uh, economical with his words. So when the evening had come, this is the evening of the first Good Friday. The sun is first around probably 3 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon now. The sun is getting close to setting for the end of March, beginning of April. It's in Palestine, so the time difference from here to there is quite noticeable. They're in the eastern Mediterranean. We're in western New York. So the sunlight is getting really, really skinny at this point. So the Friday evening, the Friday, the Saturday begins Friday night and ends Saturday night. It's that whole 24 hour period from dusk to dusk. So the Sabbath is Friday to Saturday. They have to get home before the Sabbath begins. Joseph appears. He doesn't appear anywhere else in scripture. He only shows up here in the burial scene of Jesus. Why? Who knows? He just shows up. But apparently he's a Jewish fellow. He's a member of the secret people who admire Jesus. He's got some money. He has a tomb nearby. He has to go buy the linen, which probably wasn't all that cheap, I imagine. It's fresh linen. Um, he has rights to this burial cave in the garden. He has the guts to go and approach the procurator for permission to take the body of this dead man and get a proper burial. So this guy has some foot spot. He's got some, some fortitude about him. He's got some cash. So he's really a disciple who knows what to do when the time comes to do things. So he's doing his best to take care of Jesus, to bury the dead, and to offer his own grave for this man. So, a member of the council that didn't agree with her decision to hang Jesus. But he was expecting the kingdom of God. He looked forward to the reign of Jesus. He probably didn't agree with everything the council did. They accused him of being a blasphemer. They accused him of being a um, anti-Roman sympathizer. That's why they got him crucified with Pilate. He's revving up the people. He defines uh, Caesar. So here's Joseph, who is clandestinely <laughs> listening to all these things, and yet he acts outside the council. He takes his own initiative and goes to Pilate and asks him about it. Now this is only in Mark's gospel. Pilate wondered if Jesus was already dead. He calls a centurion back to the fortress of Tony. He says, what's going on? I've heard a rumor this guy is dead. The centurion says, yeah, he's dead. Why do you think there's such a curiosity as to why is he dead? There was a heresy way back when that sort of said, Jesus really didn't die. It was a phantom. It was Judas and Caldino. It was something other than Jesus of Nazareth. So the Gospels, written 30, 40, 50 years after the events, have to really push. He was dead. He was dead of the Jordan. He was a dead as he could possibly be dead. So that's why you have this, the lance in the side. Why you have Pilate going dead already. So this, you have to have a real solid post-mortem. The guy has to be dead. Otherwise, the resurrection would not done. He wasn't in a coma. He wasn't sleeping. He wasn't drugged. He was actually deceased. 
no brain waves, no heartbeat, no blood, gone. That's why they keep emphasizing, well, is he dead? That's why we have the scripture saying, is he dead? Because he has to be dead. Otherwise, what's the point? So, Pilate gets the question answered. Joseph takes the body down from the cross, wraps it in the linen cloth, the shroud, and lays it in the tomb. Now, there aren't any caves around here, are there caves around here? You guys familiar with caves? Okay. There are caves all over Judea. There are quarries all over Judea, which have caves in them. The one that is now venerated as the key of the resurrection in the Church of the Resurrection Church of Anastasis, the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, they've dug down as much as they can dig down. And originally, the site of the Balmaha, the site of the uh, burial, was outside the city walls. Now it's inside the city walls, but back then it was outside. They found out this is a used and then disused limestone or <clears throat> if you put a body unembalmed into a limestone cave guess what happens it gets eaten up by the limestone it decays much more quickly and that was a good thing say someone dies and then 10 years later they come back to the tomb and you see that Uncle Mordecai, his body has been decayed. There's nothing there for the bones. You sweep up the bones and put them in a smaller box, or an ossuary or a bone box, and then put that in a smaller <coughs> and then put someone else on the marble shelf where he was. So you can reuse the tomb over and over again. Again, here, a tomb where no one has been buried before. A rock tomb. No one has been laid in this tomb before. It's a virgin tomb. Now, why would that be particularly? What else about Jesus? Virginal. Virgin birth. Virgin birth. Virgin birth. Womb to tomb. You get it coming and going with Jesus. There's, there's this connection between the early life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, and the death and burial and rising of Jesus. It's one big piece. Nothing is overlooked. So you've got the virgin tomb and the virgin womb. Both bespeak who he is. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So we have the quarries and the caves. This one was of limestone. If we find out limestone, we want to uh, help the decomposition process. So had Jesus been there longer? That's why they made the big, pardon the pun, the big stink about Lazarus being in the tomb for four days? Tells you what it's about. Because he was buried probably in a limestone quarry like Jesus was, and there would have been a certain amount of quickly decomposing mess. So. Also in Mark, and also in Matthew, but not in Luke or John, Mary Magdalene is a witness to the very Surprise. And also in Mark, Mary, the mother of Joseph, both see with the body. Because a few days later, they have to come back and the body. Anyone have any questions on Mark's burial narrative? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's a little more complicated to be it's worth jumping. So Matthew's text. When it was evening, there's that Friday night again, or on the eve of the Sabbath. There's also a special Sabbath. In John's Gospel, it's the Sabbath of the Passover. So you have double jeopardy. Not only is it the Sabbath, it's the Sabbath and the Passover at the same time. So you're really going to get yourself home. Otherwise, you're in double trouble. So again, we have the rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. The linen cloth. Not a mummification per se, where you wrap it individually, the fingers and the toes of each limb, but you just wrap it basically in a sheet, a shroud, over the body. So you have Joseph in Matthew, Mark, and Luke doing this by himself. In John, he has Nicodemus help him. And Nicodemus is the one who brings the 100 pounds of 
the spices, the myrrh, the aloe. But you have Joseph being so attentive. There's a new, brand new linen cloth, brand new shroud, a virgin tomb where no one has been put to rest yet. And even Jesus is going to put a bar in a few hours. So all this extravagance for a criminal. Remember, we've had 2,000 years to meditate on this and think about these things and write about them. The people doing these things at the time, they may have been spiritually hungering for something. They knew Jesus, but they didn't quite grasp what we grasp now with the divinity and humanity of Christ. They knew something special about this guy, but they weren't quite sure what it was. But they knew enough to do these things to him and for him. And that's where the great beauty is to read about Joseph and Mary Magdalene and uh, the centurion, you know, no matter where you he, or this man is a son of God. Um, there's a certain sense of loyalty there that's really hard to, to, not, to not miss. So the clean linen cloth is own tomb. Now here it's different. In Mark, it wasn't Joseph's tomb. Here it is, Joseph's tomb. He's giving his own final resting place up for Jesus. Pretty impressive. Joseph has some sense of faith, some sense of belief that I have to do this. Now, did Joseph in the back of his mind know this was temporary? We don't know. We call him Saint Joseph of Arimathea because of what he did, and after he died, he married the same in the Eastern churches and the Western church. But did he know about the resurrection before it happened? We don't know. So again, we have cloth, his own tomb, hewn in the rock, and then he rolled the stone to seal the tomb. And again, as with Mark, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary are there opposite the tomb. Want to have any questions? Concerns? What would the punishment be if they didn't get home in time for the Sabbath? What, what was that all about? They probably wouldn't get punished, punished. Um, their family would have gotten all their case. They could have been barred from the house. Okay. Yeah, I mean, they would have gotten in trouble. Like Jesus got in trouble with the, the elders and the priests and the scribes. Um, I think if you violate the Sabbath, it was something that Jesus was doing all the time, but he was caught, <laughs> as it were. Um, if Mary Magdalene didn't get home, of course, the Sabbath, where she gotten chastised verbally, I don't know. But there was a, there was a certain um, um, awareness that they had that the scripture proves here they have to do these things before sunset. One, there's a light, unless you have the torches. And two, they had to get home from the sun. I mean, they, they were still great religious Jews and they had to observe the religious rites on uh, the Sabbath. Yes? It might not have been a fear, but it might have been sheer devotion. Like one of us in this church. Exactly. We'd be shocked. Yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a positive, positive fear rather than a survival. Oh my God, I broke the Sabbath more than you know, hit by lightning by, by, by God. But the sense that they're good practicing Jews and they have to get this thing done to bury Jesus with peace. We'll come back in a few days and we'll, read, we'll open the tomb and we'll stretch out the cloth and we'll pack the body with these herbs and ointments. And then we'll close the tomb and go home. Well, we know that didn't happen. But that was the plan, was to go back on Sunday morning, after the Sabbath, have some of the big guys move the stone, go in the tomb, unwrap the body, anoint it, pack it with the herbs and spices, put the cloth back on, and seal the tomb again. That was the plan for Sunday morning. We know what happened. There was no body to wrap or unwrap. Any other? I just thought of something when you were speaking. These guys, guy or guy, would, they would be ritually impure, so they also had to get home. Toshi, of course, ready to be ritually impure. Ritual cleansing before they They had to go home. back and basically take a shower. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, yeah. You know, bathe in water yeah. until sunset. So they had to, because they were touching a body, not only a just, just a just dead body, but a 
dead criminals from the body who had a lot of blood, a lot of gore, a lot of mess. So it was an extra cleansing involved, I'm sure. Uh, so what they're doing is defying all the cleanliness rules of the Old Testament out of devotion to Jesus. I mean, it was prescribed to bury the body. That was not to be the body of the cross. That's also a crime. But taking the body down, cleansing the body, wrapping it, entombing it, and then going home and taking a shower, or taking a bath in the big club, and then having a Sabbath dinner with your wife and family. Yeah, that's a tall order for a Friday evening. So that's why they rush. And why Joseph had the, the hood spot to get his cloth, his cloth, get his tomb ready, ask Father for permission, go to Calvary, take him down, wrap him up, and get him in the, box, and get him in the tomb before sunset. Now if that's not devotion, I don't know what it is. If that's not loyalty. I don't know what it is. I mean, the man had his act together. And in John's Gospel, he was helped by, by Nicodemus, obviously. Anything else? Another thing that I, I was thinking earlier, too, was that when you read these accounts, certainly they, they had an obligation to bury the dead. Yes. So that was something that they had to take care of. But there seems to be a, a, just a tone of reverence that moves to these happenings. That they're, it's like they're just, it's not the base level. No, it's not even an elevation. If you remember, these texts were written several decades after the events that you be narrated. Mark, I said earlier, was the first of the four Gospels written. Paul's letters are even earlier, but Paul doesn't have much about burial. He mentions it here and there in his letters, but the Gospels have more detail. But Mark was the first of the Gospels to be written probably around 50, 52. And then after Mark came Matthew, Luke, and John was sort of like this, even after that. Um, but there is a certain re uh, reverence for elevated language, uh, a certain economy of wording. You repeat certain words to make it like, evident. He's dead. Oh, how do you know he's dead? Well, he's dead. It's all not. So there's this, this um, how do you put it? They really need to emphasize the fact that the man is dead and he's being buried in a regal, public, extravagantly lavish manner. A hundred pounds of, of murder hours, a clean shroud, a garden tomb, a hewn and a rock tomb that no one's been in before. All these details mean something. It's not just haphazard. It's not just haphazard. Does that make sense? What are all the spices for when nobody goes in the tomb to smell the body? You know, the pit is both the perfume, the well, body. Is that out of reverence and respect? It's both and. The spice, especially if you read the John's version, the spices are actually named the aloes and the myrrh. The aloes there is not your typical aloe vera plant. You have here in the States a different kind of plant in biblical terms, or like sandalwood. So they're like incense. Kind of thing. They're perfumed resin, perfumed oils, perfumed bark of trees, not the bark. They didn't embalm. We're opening up the body cavities and taking out the blood and packing like the like the mummification <coughs> process you have in Egypt. They did not do that to Jesus. They were going to just basically pack the body in all these herbs and spices to keep him smelling. Like St. John has Lazarus. Lord, he's going to stay. They don't want Jesus to stink, obviously. So they're going to probably pack under the arms, down between the legs, in the back, wherever they can pack this stuff to keep the body from decaying, from decomposing. It's also an act of reverence. Like the anointing of Mary in Bethany, she pours an arm all over him and gets in trouble with Judas. The same idea of this lavish, extravagant, regal funeral for the Messiah. These uh, ointments, the nard, the cinnamon, the fascia, the sandalwood, also appear in the Old Testament in the Song of Psalms, the marriage of the Old Testament. These are very expensive cosmetics. 
and her feelings being poured, literally poured, and packed around this man's body. It's not accidental. Yes? I was just going to say, also, the, um, the murder and the narrative, and the um, Sydney narrative that he was given with the Magi's. Yes. The murder was one of the three gifts that right. the Magi brought in Matthew's gospel. And, right. And also, too, um, Jews still to this day do not have a Yes. They do not have a So, I think I went to my first Jewish funeral back in Philadelphia back in November, and the young man who had died, they basically come in and they will wash the body, top to bottom, side to side, wrap it in a clean linen cloth, a shroud, and lay it in the coffin. In this case, it was a very pale wooden coffin. No embalming, no incisions made in the body, no blood removed, replacing the outside, nothing. Just cleaned, vested, dressed in the cloth, in the shroud, put in the box. They had the prayer service. The box was in the grave. It's lowered into the grave, so it's actually it's six feet under. People come by and throw soil on top of the coffin, and then they go to the meal. There's, like you said, there's no embalming. So they're not embalming the body of Jesus in the way we describe it now for funeral homes. They're really just perfuming the body to keep it from stanky, like they did with Lazarus. Does that make sense? Norman. Uh, is there any other reference to Joseph uh, after this time? Because I'm, I'm thinking to myself, uh, the Jews and maybe the Romans are going to come back to him and say, well, wait a minute, where did you really what you did? It? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a scene in the first Monday of Easter, or Monday of Easter week, where Matthew has the gospel and the guards fall asleep and the people come and steal the body. And they had to go run back to uh, the high priest and say, oh, we were sleeping, they came and they stole the body. Okay, here's some money, shut up, don't tell anybody, and if the governor hears about it, we'll keep you out of trouble. And that's the story circulated to this day among the Jews that the disciples came at night and they stole the body. Joseph was accused of stealing the body. Peter and John were not accused of stealing the body. They think they might would, perhaps. Uh, Mary Magdalene wanted to steal the body. So there's a sense of this really, really, really dead body. You know, he's been dead. He's really, really dead. Where are you going? But Joseph was the accused of the body stuff. Okay. And he was the idiot. I almost wondered why um, the Jewish faith person had to be buried within 24 hours. That's why. Because yeah. I can understand that, why that tradition was. I think the most that you clean the body, you wrap it up in a shroud or whatever vestment they, they use, uh, and bury them within 24 to 48 hours to max. And generally there's no autopsy, that's absolutely necessary, um, that requires cutting the body open. Uh, yeah, they have to get it buried as quickly as possible because it's not small. Now, mommy is not foolproof either. Mommy will keep you fresh. Only for a certain amount of time. After a while, the preservation process also starts to be promoted for a much, much longer time than a day or two. But it's not that long. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Moving on to Luke. This fits in perfectly because we're going to have mummies now. <laughs> Luke, chapter 23. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph. So he's good, he's righteous, he's wealthy, he's loyal, he's got his act together, he's got some fortitude to so go and check in with Pilate about the body. In the Old Testament, chapter 50 of Genesis, another man named Joseph, the son of Israel, the son of Jacob, sold by his brothers into slavery to the Ishmaelites, who are taking balm and resin, myrrh and incense, sandalwood, aloes, acacia, all these things, down to Egypt, because the Egyptians do mummification, a very radical form of the mummification. 
When Joseph eventually becomes the chief in charge of Egypt under Pharaoh, after suffering for quite a few years, his brothers come to Egypt to buy food because there's a famine going on. Joseph is playing tag with his brothers. He knows that they're there, but he doesn't let on that they that he is that he is him. The brothers don't know that Joseph is Joseph. Joseph recognizes his brothers, but they don't recognize him. So he's playing a little game with them. Oh, do you have another brother? Is is your dad still alive? And they're like, oh yeah, yeah, he's up there in the house. He says, okay, bring back son, my brother, and eventually bring back Jacob to to Egypt. After this lovely family reunion with Joseph and his brothers, we're like, oh my God, he's in this trouble. Joseph buries Jacob. Before Joseph buries Jacob back in the land of Israel, in the cave of Machpelah, he has him mummified in the full-blown Egyptian process. So Joseph takes Jacob back. He's buried with his parents, grandparents. When Joseph dies, he also is mummified in the custom of the Egyptians. Before he dies, he makes his brothers swear to take him back to Israel when they leave Egypt. They stay in Egypt, eventually become slaves, for 430 years. So here is this 430-year-old mummy lying around Egypt, waiting for the Exodus. And if you read the part about the Exodus, the book of Exodus with Moses, they're carting the body of Joseph with them the whole time. So you think of Joseph of Arimathea, think of the patriarch of Joseph. The, the name is not, there's a reason. Joseph of Arimathea was the one who mummified, as it were, or buried the body of the true Israel, Jesus. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, yes. A history question. No, that's fine. Where, 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 did, uh, where did the Egyptians come to learn how to mummify? And why did they? Two reasons, basically. One, they believed that Pharaoh and other nobles, well, Pharaoh was a god, but in order to keep Pharaoh's spirit alive, you have to have the body available. A body with its, body with its organs intact doesn't hang around too much, so you have to embalm it. So they learned some of the techniques, remove the organs, replace them with uh, cotton filled with these resins and perfumes and things, plus the soil is dry. If you leave a body out in the dry soil and not even touch it with embalming something, it'll dry out on its own. So they probably learned it by watching Mother Nature do her thing with dead bodies. So it's an animal body lost in the wilderness, or a human body from robbers down in the desert or whatever. So they learned from nature that oh, drying out a body will preserve it. Eventually they learned that they take out the organs, you soak them in salt for so many days, they take them out of salt, with all this stuff, all these resins and perfumes and oils, and then you wrap them up in all this linen, and you paint them over, put them in the coffin. But the coffin is for coffee is the clean cuts with the gold mask. But <laughs> well, they perfected it over the centuries. But, you know, probably the dryness of the soil and the belief in the apple, the Egyptian version of the apple. Does that make sense? Helpful? Not helpful? So, that's Luke. We're actually past time. Got to do John or not? Okay. John. Again, we have Joseph of Arimathea, a secret disciple of Jesus. So, he knows enough to keep things on the, the low side. Because of fear of the Jews, the disciples also, because of fear of the Jews, locked themselves in the upper room. Not, um, not a unusual situation. Again, Pilate is asked to release the body. Pilate says yes, gives permission. So Joseph came and removed 
the body of Jesus from the cross. Nicodemus, the first to come to Jesus by night. That's in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 21. John has Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish council, sneaking out, meeting Jesus privately, one-on-one, -on -one, at night. Probably for fear of his fellow council members who think he's crazy. And he and Jesus had this conversation, as we're reading those conversations now in the Gospels this week, about the wind blowing over wills and to be born again and all those things. So Nicodemus is coming along with, with Joseph, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. We mentioned that myrrh was also one of the gifts of the Magi in Matthew's Gospel. And myrrh then, and myrrh now, is one of those expensive, or potentially expensive, Resins from the tree that is used to perfume, to burn incense. And in this case, it's a preservative to keep the body as fresh as possible as long as possible. So now we have the body of Jesus wrapped up with the spices. As I said earlier, a lavish, extravagant, public, and you said, why did he get in trouble? Public regal burial. In the cross, according to the murder custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden. Why a garden? They don't say a rock quarry. They don't say a bunch of caves. They say a garden. Genesis. The garden of Eden. The garden of olives. On the Agony Garden. Jesus likes gardens. He's mistaken for a garden by Mary Magdalene. He likes gardens. But Eden, the resurrection of Jesus, recreates the universe, brings Eden back to where it was originally after or before the fall. We call Jesus the new Adam, we call Mary the new Eve. That's not fantasy, it's theological truth. The tree in the garden becomes the tree of the cross. You use one thing to redeem the other. Jesus, God, Holy Spirit, the three of them working in concert constantly, are using all these symbols, all these images, to trick our minds to get us to think about all these things, all these symbols, but they're not just symbols, they're also reality. The tree of the cross, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in Eden. You reach out your hand to the tree, take the fruit, sin of disobedience, sin of pride, eating, everyone's favorite sin. The tree, Jesus has his hands nailed to the cross. What's he reaching for? Us. Because we're the ones who reached out the tree to disobey. So he has to reach out his hands to the cross. To reverse that disobedience. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, the new tomb, virgin womb, virgin tomb. The significant singularity of Jesus, Alpha and the Omega, first and last, beginning and the end. The virgin tomb of Mary, the pure hollow of her womb, to house for nine months. The Son of God, in utter, utter purity, in utter, utter love. The virgin tomb of Joseph, where no one had ever been put. He doesn't stay long in either, either place. Mary gives birth, and the new tomb brings out the resurrection of There's a connection between the beginning and the end. Any final questions, concerns, additions, attractions? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Shall we close with a prayer? Of course. The captain always close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Lord Jesus, risen Savior, 
You are the Alpha and the Omega of our faith. On this highest of festivals, your holy word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Thank you that we can live in your light and walk in your truth. May the things you have revealed to us and the thoughts that we have shared dwell in our hearts and stir us to action. For you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to our last life. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.